The more I drive my new 7, the more I enjoy it. It's simple to operate. It handles like a dream. It saves me time and trouble. Now, obviously, you know this lever operates the windshield wipers. Right. Now, there are four separate functions. If you press downward and release, you'll activate the single wipe feature. This is quite useful when just a single wipe will do. That's not the problem, though. Is it the intermittent function? Yes. Now, let me run through that. The operation of the intermittent wiper position is more complex than you might imagine. When you move the lever up to the first position, mm -hmm. and you're not moving, the blades will wipe the windshield automatically about once every 14 seconds. But when you're moving, the wiper speed is dependent on your road speed. The faster you go, the more often the wipers sweep across your windshield. I thought the variation in speed meant that something was wrong with the windshield wiper. Not at all, not at all. Actually, there's even another function. You can set the timing for the intermittent wipers to a comfortable speed for you. You can actually program the time between sweeps. While you're moving, all you have to do is move the lever from the off position to the intermittent position and then back to the off position. Then you wait the desired length of time and move the lever into the intermittent position again, and you set the program into the intermittent wiper system, and this will continue to operate at that speed. And when you stop, say at a stop sign, the programmed timing will double automatically. So the wiper speed variations are programmed into the system. Well, that's right. The system is operating properly. Now, when you put the lever into the second position, the wipers operate at the slow speed. But when you bring the car to a stop, the wipers automatically switch to a pre-programmed intermittent speed. In the third position, mm -hmm. the wipers will operate at the fast speed, no matter how fast or slow the car is moving. This is quite a system. Thanks, George. I guess I don't have a problem with my windshield wiper after all. So while we're here, why don't we run through the two types of windshield washing systems you can use? Two? Oh, yes, there are two. In the normal one, you activate by pulling the lever toward you. Mm -hmm. And there's a second system on this car that's activated by pressing the lever toward the steering column. This pumps a more intensive washing solution that's used to get rid of stubborn dirt and bugs. When the windshield is automatically flushed with the normal solution, you'll want to remember that there are two separate reservoirs under the hood, and they should be filled with the two different washing solutions. The intensive solution goes in the reservoir with the red tag on the cap. Thanks. That's good to know, George. The only other thing you'll want to know is that this car is equipped with a headlight fog light washer system. It functions when the lights are on and you operate either windshield washer system. I had some questions about the double lock feature. I asked about them when I brought the car in for an oil change. George, a curiosity question about the central locking system. When I use the double lock feature, can I open the trunk? Oh yes, you can open the trunk when you use the double lock feature and unlock the trunk. All the doors will remain locked, so the added anti-theft protection is still working for you. Now, no door can be opened from either the inside or the outside when you activate the double lock feature. That's added protection. If you like, we can run through the operation of the whole central locking system. Good. Why don't you see if I'm missing anything? The central locking system can be operated from either inside or outside of my new 7. From inside, the driver's side lock can lock or unlock the whole system. That's all doors, the trunk, and the gas filler flap. The passenger lock can unlock the system, but not lock it. The rear door locks don't affect the system. That's right. And as a safety feature, the central locking system will unlock automatically in the event of an accident or a hard bump. From the outside, then, insert the key into either front door, turn it to this first position, and lock or unlock all four doors, the trunk and the gas filler flap. Right. And when you've locked the system this way and unlocked the trunk, all four doors open. You can close the windows or the sunroof when you lock. I usually close everything up before I get out, but sometimes you forget. So just hold the key in the locking position, and the job gets done. Another feature is that you cannot depress the door lock button when the driver's door is open. That's never been a problem for me. There's also the double lock system. Turn the master key into this position. The doors and trunk are double locked for extra anti-theft protection. The valet key will not work when you double lock the car. Use the valet key for parking lots when you want the doors and ignition available to an attendant, but you don't want to allow access to the trunk and glove compartment. Now, for some reason, the electrical system is not working. You can open the driver's side by pulling up on the door handle like this and turn the key past the normal lock position. 
Do you have the factory installed theft deterrent system? Yes, I do. Well, then you know that the double lock system activates the DWA alarm. When you double lock, the LED indicator on the dash lights up and you're all set. The only other feature of the central locking system I use are the child safety locks on the rear doors. Push the lever into that position and the kids are safe. I can open the doors from the outside after I've parked. Now with your 750, in addition to all of the features of the BMW central locking system, you have the added convenience of the infrared locking system. Convenience is the right word, George. I can be up to 20 feet from my car and lock, unlock, double lock, set the alarm, or even close the windows or sunroof if needed. And it's easy to use. Just point the rounded end of the infrared transmitter toward the receiver by the sunroof switch. To lock, touch button number one, like this. To unlock, press button number two, like this. What I like most about the unlocking function is that it automatically switches off the alarm and turns on the car's interior lights. If the windows or the sunroof are open, just hold button number one until they are closed. A touch on number three, and the car is double locked and the alarm system is activated. If you need any additional transmitters, just let me know. I can order two more for you from BMW. Thanks, George. I was in for service, so I asked about the driving options of the automatic transmission. Good morning, Mrs. Kelly. Hello, George. I haven't seen you in quite a while. Would you like to take a minute to review the automatic transmission options? Sure. Well, why don't we go over them? Okay. Now, this switch provides two options. The A for normal automatic economy and M for manual. Right. The car will always start in the A position. A gives you the best fuel economy and uh, uses all four forward gears. Select the M position and it's like a manual transmission. I use the M for quick acceleration. You can really take off from a light, but you can also use the manual program when starting on icy roads in the winter. Just shift into the three position and you pull out smoothly and steadily on hazardous roads. In the three position, you eliminate the fourth gear overdrive for that sportier feeling. Now also, the three sport option can be used in hot weather to increase the output of the air conditioning system. There's also a built-in safety feature for this transmission. If you ever see transmission light up on your check control display, it means that you have an electronic transmission control problem. A backup system comes into play so that third gear in reverse remain operable. Now, if that should ever happen, bring the car right in for service. After I learned how to use all the functions of the onboard computer, I don't know how I got along without it. George, could you run through the onboard computer with me? I use it almost every trip, and I want to make sure that I'm getting the full benefit from everything that it does. Oh, sure, I'll be glad to. We'll take it from the top and review all the functions. Now, you know that the key has to be in the one position or beyond for the computer to operate. Right. As a safety precaution, I advise everyone to input all of their onboard computer information before they get on the road. You're familiar with the setup. The four number buttons are here, and the ten function buttons are here below the display, plus the set reset button. Now, this button changes the system from normal to metric and back. Now, this button shows the time or the date. When the time is displayed, you can press the SR button and a symbol comes up here. That's set now to beep just before each hour. It helps me be on time for appointments. To reset the time, press the number input button when the time is displayed. AM or PM will flash to let you know a new time setting is being made. Once you're set, press the SR button to activate the clock again. If you have to change from AM to PM, Press the 1000 button twice, then SR, and the change is made. Reset the date the same way. Punch up date, the four input buttons, SR, and the computer is on track. Same for the year. Now press this button, and you get one of the two average fuel consumption readings. Press it again, and you see a display of the other. Press SR, start a new calculation. When the range button is pressed, the display shows the driving range left in miles on the remaining gas in the tank. Now, if you see a plus sign in front of the number, that just indicates a full tank of gas. Now, this button shows the average miles per hour that you've been driving. Press set, reset, you start a new calculation. This button tells you the current outside temperature. And if the outside temperature falls below 37 degrees, a gong sounds automatically, which is a good warning to be careful about the road surface freezing. Below 37 degrees shows up on the check control display also. To cancel the display, just press any other computer function. It cancels automatically if the outside temperature warms up to 42 degrees or above. 
For the computer to calculate arrival time, program in the mileage to the destination with this button and the four input number buttons, then press SR. During the trip, press this button and the display estimates arrival time. The computer calculates the distance left on the trip and your current speed to get that estimate. Now this button is very important to me. It's the speed limit warning. I program in the top speed I want to go with the number buttons and the computer warns me with a gong and a display when I reach my pre-programmed speed. Press the button to check the preset speed limit and then again to activate the system. When you're on the road, you can even program your current driving speed as a limit warning by pressing the set reset button as long as that function has been activated. Now that I didn't know. Now this is used on warm days to program the ventilation system to kick in when the car has been parked for a while. Before going into an appointment, press the timer button twice, input the time, press SR. And if I'm not sure when I'll be finished, I program in a second time to make sure the car is comfortable when I get back. Turn it off by pushing SR if I get back in between the two settings. You know that all of the computer displays can be seen on the information center in your instrument cluster. Just press the turn signal in and they appear. Press in again to read another computer function display. The only one that isn't displayed, of course, is your anti-theft number. Now, if you only want selected functions displayed, press the turn signal in and hold it for three seconds. P1 will appear. Then release the lever and press the function buttons of the items you want displayed. Press SR and the program is set. You release the program in a similar way. Press in the lever. Hold for three seconds. Wait for P1 to appear and press SR. The program is erased and all functions will be displayed. Computer functions can only be seen when there is no check control information displayed. Now, the other computer function that I use every day is the anti-theft protection code. Put the key in position one, press code, and the current number is displayed. Input a four-digit number with the four input buttons Press SR, take out the key. That light indicates that the code function is activated. When you want to restart the engine, a gong sounds. The word code appears here, and you must enter the right number sequence before you can start the engine. Three wrong attempts, and the alarm goes off. And you know the radio and hood are also monitored by the code function. Right. That's why I use the anti-theft code function every day. I lock the number I've chosen into my brain, and I have a greater feeling of confidence against possible theft. Now, this section here, Mrs. Kelly, I call the Information Center. You can see important messages easily on this display. Here at the bottom is the Service Interval Indicator. That tells me when to call you, right? Yes. And when the fifth green light goes out, I call for an appointment. Yes. After the fifth green light goes out, the yellow light will come on and display either oil service or inspection. And when the red light comes on, you're past due. We reset the lights after the service is completed. I noticed that when I picked up the car last week. Above that row is the check control display. That's the one that says seat belts when I start the car. That's it. And also, I'm sure you've noticed that a gong will sound every time a message is displayed. Oh, yes. That always gets my attention. Because those messages are important and tell you about operational safety or the running condition of the car, these warnings appear as soon as they happen and won't go off until they're corrected. If a second problem happens at the same time, the first message will be canceled and the second message will be displayed. A plus sign will appear to the right here, letting you know that there's more than one message. You just press the check control button to see the second message. It sounds as if I should pay attention to that display if it comes on. Well, yes, Mrs. Kelly. All of the check control messages are important to you for safety and are also important to avoid damage to the engine of the car. Now, there are actually two priority groups in the warning system. Group one includes things like engine oil pressure and worn brake linings. Priority group two will alert you to low fluid levels like the coolant or washer fluid. These group two messages will only be displayed when you turn the car on or off for roughly 20 seconds, and then will cancel out. You can recall the group two messages for up to two minutes after you turn off the ignition by pressing the check control button. That section is really very important, isn't it? It should never be ignored. There's another feature to it, though, that I think is kind of interesting. The display can be seen in six different languages. When you turn the key to position one, press the control button for 10 seconds. The display will show U.S. English, British English, French, Italian, Spanish, and German. You know, George, if you have the time, I'd like to find out a little bit more about the indicator lights here. 
Now, these indicator lights are very important for any driver, Mrs. Kelly. I know this light comes on when I pull the parking brake. Mm -hmm. There's another brake indicator light that is tied to the braking and power steering systems to monitor hydraulic pressure. The thing to remember is that if that light comes on while you're driving, your fluid levels are probably low. If it flashes while you're driving, you've lost pressure in either the brake or the power steering system. The thing to do then is to pull over and check the fluid levels under the hood. I'll show you where they are. That's a good idea. I like to know where these things are. Now, this is the warning light for the anti-lock braking system. If it goes on while you're driving, it shows that the control unit has spotted a fault in the system. Normal braking is not effective. The brake system will function in a safe, normal way. The control unit simply shuts off the anti-lock braking system. This indicator, which reads SRS, is connected to the airbag system. If it lights up, it indicates a fault in that system and tells you that the airbag will not function in case of an accident. The next thing you're going to tell me is that if those lights go on, I should bring the car in for service. You've got it, Mrs. Kelly. And there are a few more lights that will tell you to call me if they come on. This red one is the oil pressure light. Don't worry about it if it comes on briefly when you start the car or when you're idling. It should go out when you press down on the accelerator. But if it comes on while you're driving, pull off the road, shut off the ignition, and check the oil level. If the oil level is correct, it means that you're operating with low oil pressure and you could do serious damage to the engine. Call me right away. Another important light to watch is this red battery charge light. If it comes on, have the car checked as soon as possible to find the problem and to avoid getting stranded. Now, these over on the left, I know, the odometer and the trip odometer. I reset this just before a long trip. This one goes on when I switch on the fog lights and the headlights. Mm -hmm. But this one, I don't know about. That's the check engine indicator. That'll go on or flash when there's a problem with the engine management system. If this light comes on, you can still drive, but go to the nearest BMW dealer. The rest of this I know, George. That's the fuel gauge, and when the yellow light goes on, I go for gas. Yes, the yellow light indicates roughly two gallons left in the tank. I kind of like the fact that the speedometer shows both miles per hour and kilometers, because Jerry and I go to Canada quite often. This is for the turn signals and the high beams. You know about the feature that lets you use the turn signal for lane changes, passing, that sort of thing. Yes, I just press it quickly and it automatically returns to the normal position, even if I don't turn the wheel. And, of course, the high beam control is also a part of this lever. And the blue indicator light lets you know they're on. Why is there a red section in the tachometer? Well, that's to tell you that your engine speed is too high. You avoid that. Excessive engine speed can cause real damage. Well, I've gone pretty fast, but I've never hit the red. No, it's engine speed, Miss Kelly. It can happen when you downshift or when you're driving downhill. There's a fuel injection control unit that has a fuel cutoff circuit that limits maximum engine speed when you're accelerating. It kicks in when the needle hits the red warning zone. Does that have something to do with the fuel consumption indicator below the tack? Well, that's a device that helps you maximize fuel economy if you want to. And I always check the temperature gauge over here to make sure my engine isn't running too hot. Mm -hmm. If the needle hangs in the red zone, make sure you pull the car off the road and give your car a chance to cool down. When your engine's overheated, Mrs. Kelly, the words coolant temp will show up on the check control panel. Uh, come and see me right away if that happens. Well, I don't have any problem with the headlight switch over here or the fog light switch, but I'm not happy with the brightness of the dashboard lights. Now, you can control the intensity by turning that knob just below the headlight switch. Oh, by the way, does it mean anything that all the lights go on when I start the car? No, that's a built-in bulb test, that's all. Should we take a minute to go over the cruise control system? That would be great. George, I do a lot of traveling in my business, and most of it is long trips, so I would be lost without cruise control. Now, I just get up to the speed that I want, I push the lever towards the front of the car, let it go, and the speed is set. Well, you're using cruise control for the right job, all right. You should never use it when you're in heavy traffic or driving on a slippery or a loose road service like sand or gravel. Also, it's a good idea to never use cruise control on a winding road where you can't maintain a constant speed. Once the cruise control is set, how can you increase speed? Well, to increase the speed the cruise control is set at, just hold the lever in this position and you'll accelerate. When you reach the speed that you want to keep, release the lever and the speed control unit memorizes that new speed. By the way, you can still use the accelerator to increase speed if you're passing. When you release the pedal, the cruise control takes you back to your selected speed. Now, you can also use the cruise control lever to decrease speed. You pull the lever back toward the steering wheel, slow down to the speed you want, release the lever, and cruise control maintains the new speed that's been set. 
And by tapping the lever like that, or like that, you can increase or decrease the speed setting by roughly one mile per hour. You switch off the cruise control by moving the lever down or stepping on the brake. If you want to go back to a set speed, just push the lever up. Right. There are also some safety features built into the cruise control system. It will shut off automatically if you move the gear shift from drive to neutral or if you're slowing down at a fast rate, say five feet per second. If you had a standard transmission, cruise control would shut off when you stepped on the clutch. And the memory is canceled every time you turn the ignition off. Let me walk you through this, Mrs. Kelly, in case there are any features you might have missed. Okay, I'm listening. As you know, there are separate adjustments here and here, which control the temperature for the driver and front passenger. Now, this panel controls both heating and air conditioning. The temperature scales simply guide you in selecting a pleasant comfort level for you. The system will reach the chosen setting as soon as possible after the car is started. You should only need small adjustments once you're underway. When the driver's side is set at either extreme, the system overrides the passenger setting and the climate control functions at the driver's setting. This center control is the master switch for turning the whole system on or off, and it also controls blower fan speed. This first position is low speed, and turned like this, it's maximum speed. Between the two extremes, this wedge indicates gradually increased fan speed setting. These buttons allow you to choose the air distribution patterns. This one sends air through all the ventilation grills and is especially useful in hot weather when you want to cool off the whole car. Now, this button sends most of the processed air through the footwell outlets. Sends some air into the defroster, and I think this is most useful in cold weather. Now, this center button automatically controls the air distribution and is dependent on both the outside and inside temperatures. The auto mode is controlled by a microprocessor in the air conditioning system. Automatic is the setting which you'll use most of the time. A nice feature of this system is that it's programmed to prevent cold drafts on the driver and passenger when you start the car in cold weather. No matter which distribution button you select, in cold weather the air is routed through the defroster until the engine warms up to a point where the airflow is going to be comfortable for you. At that time, the preset button takes over. Now, these three buttons are key to specific system functions. This one for maximum defrosting, where all the air is routed at maximum blower speed to the defroster outlets. The air is heated and dehumidified. When this button is engaged, the rear window defroster is automatically turned on. When you release this button, the previous setting is re-established, but the rear window defroster stays on. This center button turns on the air conditioning compressor. The air conditioning system works for all air distribution programs when it's above 33 degrees outside the car. During rainy or humid weather, you may encounter a light fogging or misting of the windows. Pressing the AC button will quickly reduce this. This last button is to recirculate air. It closes the fresh air flaps and should be used when the outside air is polluted. Now, you shouldn't use this for too long because the quality of recirculated air deteriorates quickly. Some other features of the climate control system are that the temperature of the air from the center vents can be made warmer or cooler by using this knob. For your rear seat passenger's comfort, fresh air or air conditioned air comes through these vents. But keep in mind that air to these vents is automatically switched off when you press the footwell only button on the driver's side. Might as well mention the rear window defroster while I'm at it. Remember the rear window defroster goes on automatically when the main defroster button is pushed. You also turn on the system independently with this switch. Once the system is on, it remains in the fast defrost mode for 10 minutes and the switch stays lit. After the 10 minutes are up, you don't switch the system off, the heater control unit is automatically set to a timed sequence to keep the window clear. The switch is not lit in this mode. If you push the button again during the time sequence, you activate the fast defrost for another 10 minutes. If you push the button twice, you switch the system off. Are the outside heated mirrors controlled through the rear defroster system? No, they work automatically when the outside temperature falls below 41 degrees. The lower portion of the windshield is also heated that way. Well, that's about it, unless you have any questions. No, I think I understand the climate control, but I would like to ask you a few questions about the electric seats. Are you the only one who drives the car, Mrs. Kelly? No, my husband loves the car, so we kind of share it. Well, you know you can preset the seat and side mirrors to a comfortable position and just hit the memory button so that you don't have to reset everything when you change drivers. Exactly. How does that work, George? Well, let me run over the complete system with you. Those two knobs control ten different adjustments for the driver's seat. The larger knob controls the seat cushion and lets you adjust the angle of the seat. It can move the whole seat backwards or forwards. It can raise the seat, it can lower the seat. 
The small knob controls the backrest. As you know, moving it forward or backward changes the angle, and moving it up or down will raise or lower the headrest. That part I've got down pat, George. Well, have you noticed that the seat belts adjust automatically to the change in seat position? Ah, no wonder the seat belts are so comfortable. <laughs> when you change the seat position, you'll probably want to adjust the outside mirrors. As you know, those two are controlled by the switches on the armrest. The larger one moves the mirrors up or down, right or left. And the small one is for either the left or the right side mirror. Once I've adjusted everything, I don't quite know how to lock it into the memory. Well, to program the memory, just put the ignition key in either the first or second position and press the memory button and either one, two, or three. That's it. The setting's now memorized. So I can be number one and my husband can be number two. Right, Mrs. Kelly. Now, if you want to recall your preset seat and mirror positions, there are a couple of ways to do it. First is when you open the driver's door, press 1. Then the seats and mirrors will go to the memorized position. If you get into the car and close the door, you can start the automatic memory while the delay circuit keeps the interior lights on. If you miss it, you can either hold your number 1 or just put the ignition key in position 1 and press your number. And that's all there is to it? Well, not quite, Miss Kelly. There's a safety feature that doesn't allow you to turn on the memory circuit accidentally while you're driving. If you haven't hit the preset number button before you begin driving, you can still adjust the seat and mirrors automatically by holding down your preset memory number one, in your case, until the full adjustment is made. If you want to stop at any point, just press any of the mirror or seat buttons, or even the memory button. While we're talking about this, there is something wrong with the right side mirror, George. It seems to have a mind of its own. <laughs> you mean when you put the car in reverse, the right side mirror tilts down? Yes. But you said that like it's supposed to. It is. It's an automatic tilt that lets you see the curb and the lower part of the car while you're parking. If you don't want to use it, just set the selector switch for the right side mirror and it won't tilt. Can I set a comfortable position for the passenger seat into the memory position also? No, no. Memory's only for the driver's seat. By the way, I know it hasn't been cold enough, but this winter you'll want to know how to use the heated seats. Well, it may not have been cold enough for you, George, but I've used the heated seat several times. Generally, I press this button to warm the seat up, and then when I'm comfortable, I move the switch to this position to keep it warm. Remember, for the passenger seat heater to operate, they must first fasten their seat belt. If you have people sitting in the back seat, they can adjust the seat cushion for total comfort. All they have to do is use the switch on the side of the rear seat cushion, and the seat will either move forward or toward the back. The rear headrests are also adjustable. The switch on the side of the rear cushion adjusts the height of the rear headrest. When the seat belt is snapped in, the headrest automatically goes to its highest position. The passenger adjusts it for comfort, and when the seat belt is unfastened at the end of the trip, the headrest automatically goes back to its lowest position. Now, do you have any questions about the electric windows, Miss Kelly? They're just like any other electric windows, aren't they, George? Well, no, not quite. There are a couple of special features that I think are important. One is that the electric windows work after you turn the car off until you open one of the front doors. Now, that ties in with the key system you told me about before. Yes. Either way, you can make sure the car is closed up. There is a little safety feature here, which is a good idea if you have kids in the back seat. Just press this button, and the kids can't open their rear windows. In addition, you have the kid-proof switches on the outside of the rear doors. It's for safety. I like the automatic feature you showed me when I was in last time. Yes, isn't that great when you pull up for a toll? All you have to do is tap the window button, and your window opens or closes. And all you have to do is hit any button if you want to stop the window. The sunroof has that little tapping feature too, doesn't it? Yes, you just tap it in the appropriate direction, and the sunroof will either open or close. And to partially open the sunroof, just slide the switch toward the back and hold it until it reaches the position you want. Push it the opposite way to close it. How do I work the sunroof vent, George? Well, that's simple, Miss Kelly. Just press the button up, and the vent will open. Press it forward, and it'll close. The sunroof can be operated any time you can operate the windows. Now, this is something you'll probably never have to use, Miss Kelly. But in case there's an electrical failure in the car, you can manually close the sunroof. Just take this cover off and use a tool that I'll show you that's in the trunk toolkit. The sunroof will just wind close. I've never touched this switch here, George. Should I? Well, that's the button that controls the interior lights. You probably haven't needed to touch it because it's set on automatic. That means the lights go on when you lift the door handle to get in the car. They stay on for a few seconds. The lights, of course, go on when you open the door. 
If you want to turn the lights on all the time, push the switch this way. And if you want them off all the time, push it that way. It's another nice feature, Mrs. Kelly, that's handy at night. If you turn the engine off after driving with the headlights on, the inside lights go on automatically and stay on for a while, even with the doors closed. An added feature that you'll appreciate, Miss Kelly, is the lighted vanity mirror. It's located right here in the back side of the sun visor, and it's very handy for a last check when you're on your way out for the evening. That's a nice added touch. Knowing how important the sound system is to me, my service advisor took some time to review all of its features. This is a terrific sound system. Yes, it is. And it's really quite simple to operate. Turn the radio on and choose AM, FM, weather band, or pop in a cassette. This is the volume control. When I'm listening to a stereo FM station, the little ST lights up here. Choose the weather band, and the radio automatically tunes to a weather station. If there isn't one in the area, the radio beeps. When I'm listening to a cassette, I always push this Dolby button for better sound on Dolby cassettes. Do you ever use the mode switch? Of course, I use it to adjust the whole sound system to my ear. Press the mode switch to change bass, treble, fade, front and rear, and balance, left and right. Then press the plus or minus switch to tweak the sound to your liking. To go back to center or flat, just hold the mode switch in. It's as simple as that. You sound like quite an audio buff. I am. I, I enjoy every feature of this radio system, even the tuning options. This switch lets me choose whether I want to change stations manually or let the radio scan to find the next station automatically. Push the volume switch in, and the radio finds a station and stops there for a moment before going on to the next one. If there is a station I particularly like, just push the volume button in again, and the station is locked in. If it becomes a favorite station, program it into these preset buttons by pressing one of them in like this. The radio beeps, and the station is programmed. So you can preset 6 AM and 6 FM stations. In addition to the radio setup, the cassette player also has a series of options. You turn the radio on, and you insert a cassette, and the system automatically switches to the tape mode. The track that's playing is shown here on the display. Push the volume button in, the unit switches to the other track. Move the radio station select lever to the first position to fast forward to the end, or rewind back to the beginning of the tape. Move it to the second position, like this, and you activate the tape seek function. Push the lever up, and you advance the tape to the next selection. Push it down, and rewind to the last selection you played. This button is used to skip over long blank sections of tape. Finish a tape, press this button, and the tape is ejected. It's as easy as that. I'm glad that BMW built in the anti-theft protection. That red light really is a deterrent. Oh, by the way, if the power is ever disconnected from the radio, and then reconnected, the word code will come up on the display when you turn the radio on. Just check your radio owner's handbook and punch in the pre-assigned five-digit code using the preset buttons. Thanks, George. I didn't know about that. Have you used the CD player much? I use it all the time. There's no other sound that equals the quality and power of a CD. The changer operates through the radio system. Load the CD magazine tray with six discs and insert it into the unit in the trunk. Turn on the radio and listen to a private concert. Press the band selector until CD is displayed. The preset buttons, one through six, correspond to each disc. Press a number and that disc will play, right? Right. The first cut on the first disc automatically comes on. To change discs, press one of these buttons. Push the on-off switch to activate the scan feature. Push it again when it finds the selection you want and it goes back to normal operation. And this lever operates the fast forward and reverse functions. Raise it one step for fast forward, lower it one step for fast reverse. Raise or lower it two notches, and you activate the track search. Right, that's it, George. Just listen to the whole car fill up with great sound. Do you use a cellular phone often? Yes, it saves me a lot of time and energy. I can make appointments from the road, even call home and say I'm on the way. I like the choice of normal or hands-free operation. I use the hands-free on the road for safety. Let's see if I remember the full operating procedures. Now, the ignition must be either on or in the accessory position. The power light must be on, and the no service and lock indicator must be off, right? Right. 
Then press the power switch, key in your lock code, punch in the number, press send, and the in-use light comes on and the call is dialed. Now, if the no service indicator comes on, it means that you're out of a cellular range or there's no cellular service in the area. When the number goes through and someone answers, you'll hear it through this speaker. And just talk in a normal voice. I keep the radio turned down or off and the windows closed when using the hands-free option because it's easier to hear for both parties. When you end the call, you just press the end button here. That's something you better remember because if you don't press end, the usage time continues to be charged. That can be expensive. And you can use the handset just like you would any other telephone. And remember to press end when you finish the call, just as you would with the hands-free option. When you park, always lock the phone for obvious reasons. Press the function button, then the number four button. Lock is displayed on the panel, so you know the phone is secured. Why don't we look under the hood so I can point out the fuse box and a few other things that you should know about. That's a good idea, George. Now, this is the main fuse box. As you can see, it has spare fuses, a fuse puller, and electrical relays. If a fuse blows, you can spot it by the melted metal strip right here inside the housing. Now, remove the blown fuse and insert a new one. Make sure you replace the fuse with a fuse of the same rating. You can see that right here. You don't ever want to replace a blown fuse with one of a higher capacity or with a wire. That's dangerous. There are a few more extra fuses in the secondary fuse box under the rear seat. If the battery is under the back seat, George, how do I help my neighbor out when she needs a jump start? Well, that's easy. Here's the battery connector. You just attach the positive cable to this clamp and the negative to a suitable ground point, and you're ready to help. You can use this setup if you ever need a battery charge. Like I said, the battery compartment is under the rear seat along with the secondary fuse box. I guess that just about does it. Thank you, George.